All right, welcome to the Student Games Festival 2020 design panel. My name is Bo, and I'll be moderating this panel covering concepts and theories of design. If anyone has any questions for our panelists, please have them ready to post in our Twitch chat. We'll address them towards the end of the panel. I'll be presenting questions and queries to the panelists who are gonna discuss the topic at hand. Um, and all of our panelists are free to jump in and out of conversation whenever they like. So uh, to start, um, let's have our panelists please introduce themselves, what they do, what games they've worked on, if uh, they can't talk about what they're working on right now. Um, we can start with Carrie, and then we'll pass the torch down from there. My name is Carrie Patel. I'm a senior narrative designer and project lead at Obsidian Entertainment. I've worked on the Outer Worlds and the Pillars of Eternity games. So nice to see everyone. Nice to see you. And Craig? Uh, hello, my name is Craig Morrison. I am a principal designer at Blizzard Entertainment. Uh, I currently work on World of Warcraft. Uh, I've been working in MMOs uh, for almost uh, 20 years now. I worked previously at a company called Funcom, worked on games like Anarchy Online, Age of Conan, and The Secret World. Uh, and I also teach game design uh, at the U at UCI here in Irvine. Nice to have you here. Uh, Ian? Hi. I'm Ian. Uh, I actually just graduated last year from UCSC's game design program. Uh, I worked on a bunch of games there for school, but also with clubs like uh, GDA, which I imagine there are some people here from there. Uh, and then I had a senior project called Squish that I showed off at E3, and that's where I met some people at Player First Games, where I'm now working as a game designer on an unannounced project. All right, happy to have you here. And Jessica? Game and level designer at Ember Lab uh, on an unannounced title. But before that, I worked with Obsidian Entertainment uh, as a UI designer and system designer on Armored Warfare and a character artist on South Park Stick of Truth. All right. Um, looks like we might have a little bit of an audio delay, but I think we should be good now. We're gonna get into the questions as long as the moderators don't tell me we have a problem. All right. All right, um, Kyle, or uh, sorry, uh, we'll go ahead and start. Um, so for our first question, um, we have, uh, it's uh, interesting for, it's for here, game designers talking about what they appreciate in certain games, um, especially because of the experience you guys have. Um, what have you guys been playing and did anything about the game's design surprise you? Well, uh, lately I've been playing some Civilization VI with my husband, uh, watching him play Resident Evil 3 and uh, getting to the end of Subnautica on my own. Um, all very different experiences, but a lot of fun. Um, and I feel like one thing I appreciate uh, that definitely Civ VI and Subnautica do in their own ways is giving, uh, giving players multiple ways to succeed at a particular objective. Um, I feel like it's it's always rewarding, and this is something we encounter a lot in our PG design, sort of giving the player a field of options and letting them choose the path that feels truest to their play style and the character they're building. And it's interesting to see how different types of games achieve that. Um, similarly, Subnautica does an incredible job of uh, blending both the narrative hooks and um, the mechanical draws to encourage the player to explore further, progress, um, you know, enhance their, their abilities and resources. Um, and so it's very satisfying to see that done so well and so neatly. Yeah, I think for me, it, I've been playing the remake of Final Fantasy VII uh, and I was a huge Final Fantasy fan. I loved it. I think I had like 200 hours in the original game like 20 years ago uh, when I was a student and had much more time to play uh, games and I could actually put 200 hours into a computer game. Uh, and it's really fascinating for me, especially as someone who works on a game like World of Warcraft, which is 15 years old. It's fascinating seeing how the designers have been able to update the game, even the game's narrative and characters and do that successfully. I think the remake is an, is an awesome experience and it's uh, been a really cool game to play through. I've kind of been rationing it so that I didn't finish it too quickly because uh, I wanted the experience to last. 
but seeing how they've gone through and update old content that people hold really close to their heart. And I think when you're dealing with existing IPs as a designer, there's this really interesting balancing act that you've got to play between being true to the kind of emotional feeling of the characters and the IP that you're working with, yet also wanting to update it and bringing up, you know, making it, making the experience fit with a modern setting. Uh, and I think they did a fantastic job. Uh, the folks at Square did a, a wonderful job with the with the remake in that regard. Trying to like um, respect the roots. Yeah, because we all have very emotional attachments uh, to the games that we remember fondly. Uh, Actually, I've, oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I've been playing a lot of Animal Cro Crossing recently, and it's my my first Animal Crossing, and I think it's been really interesting seeing a game that is way more freeform and way more chill than a lot of a lot of popular triple A games are today, and seeing that really flourish with so many different people, um, it's been really refreshing to kind of go into something and not have an objective but not feel like i need to have one and just like water plants or rearrange some fencing and feel really accomplished doing very kind of small and simple things um because a lot of games i usually play are all about having quests and progression systems and that feeling of constantly being rewarded and i still love those games but it's been really nice to see something go the complete opposite direction and really make an impact with that. There's a great game gameplay loop in the Animal Crossing games. <laughs> yeah, and I think for my part, probably my favorite thing in games is when you can really nail down what the character must be feeling in a moment through a gameplay mechanic or a subversion in a gameplay mechanic. Um, so really kind of fun too when a game can set a rule like, oh, movement works this way, but suddenly something's happened to your character and it's going to change. I think, for instance, The Last of Us did that very well. Um, I'm trying to think of a way to not spoil it. But some of my favorite moments are where you think you know how the game works, and then it says, uh oh, your situations change. Um, and now the controls work a little different, or your mechanics work a little different. And I think that that being able to deliver a gut punch to the player at the right moment um, with a mechanic is always a, just like, ah, oh, game design. <laughs> yeah. I think Animal Crossing has probably came out at just the right time as well. <laughs> it's really interesting seeing the cultural impact of a game like tied to the current situation in the world and where people kind of really need Animal Crossing. Uh, you know, it, it's something that kind of can help with uh, the current situation that people find themselves in. So it's a kind of, there's a fascinating element there for designers because those designers couldn't have designed for that, but it's like, there's this serendipitous kind of almost convergence of things that makes the impact of Animal Crossing like right now uh, a little bit more powerful. I think the pacing of Animal Crossing is done very well. You could take it really slowly or very fast. Um, and actually, we had a question uh, for pacing. So uh, going into that, um, in both level and narrative design, um, are there any rules that you folk find helpful for nailing down pacing? Um, in narrative, we often hear of the rule of three. Uh, in your experience, does this apply to level design or even UI design as well? Um, or do you use other concepts? Go ahead, Karen. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think uh, in, in a lot of what I see, especially again in RPG design, where you have a lot of different mechanics and modes of interaction that players can engage with, uh, variety is super important to pacing. Um, it's really easy, you know, especially when you're kind of a especially when you're focused in one discipline or another, like maybe you're really, uh, you know, you're a combat designer, you're a narrative designer, um, to, you know, to hone in on that one thing and just try to deliver uh, really big expansive experiences for the player. And those are important, but like, even when the writing is great and, you know, some players are coming for the story, um, you don't want to throw them into just one dialogue after another, no matter how well written they are. Um, and same thing with combat. Uh, you know, even if the combats are fantastic, you want to give players a breather from time to time. Um, 
And, you know, you want to make sure that you're pulling them through a variety of experiences, a variety of challenge levels, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and I think the second thing is a good balance of clarity, but also, um, again, especially in something like an RPG, letting the player feel like they're driving the experience forward. Um, I think nothing will kill a player's momentum faster than not really knowing what they're supposed to be doing next. Um, so making sure that players aren't confused about, uh, you know, what to do next in their in their experience, but without necessarily like, you know, pulling them by the hand along, uh, you know, a super rigid, narrow experience that doesn't, that prevents them from having an opportunity to feel like they're exploring, they're making things happen. That's a difficult balance, but an important one. Yeah. And doing it with intention. I think understanding the experience that you're trying to create for your players because you have different types of players who have different types of maybe, you know, different availability to play the game for different periods of time. And making sure that you can design the experience so that it is not, it kind of supports a player who wants to play all the way through just as much as it does the player who wants discrete points to stop. So it's like where you place save points, where you place chapter ends, but still entice the player on. So like the player that wants to continue is like, oh, there's a save point here, but oh no, I really want to know what happens next. So, you know, yeah, quick save and, and move mm -hmm. on. But you've given the other type of player the opportunity to go, oh, cool, okay, I'm done. I need to go look after the kids or cook dinner or whatever else I'm doing, do homework. Uh, here's a stopping point. And being right. intentional with it so that you start to understand where the moments of peak emotional resonance are with the player and giving them that opportunity to take a breather after a climactic experience or building up tension to the moment where you as the designer want the player to feel the most tension, uh, kind of being deliberate with it. So each game, there, you asked if there was any rules. I'd say there's no one rule that fits every scenario. It's about, as a designer, understanding what, you, what emotions you want the player to experience and then trying to design your pacing around that experience. Oh, sorry, and yeah, to that got, point, yeah. um, <laughs> I, I typically, when I design a level, I play through it many times, um, and then I have other people play through it um, and watch to make sure that they're feeling the same things um, that I was aiming for. Um, so yeah, when I start, I usually start with an emotional prompt of like, ah, oh, this is where the character's feeling fear, or this is exciting, and this is fun. Um, and knowing what tools I have in my chest, knowing that I can use a cutscene somewhere, or that I can use a piece of combat, or that I can use a puzzle. Um, and becoming kind of familiar with the pacing of those, um, familiar with how I can, again, subvert things um, if it's appropriate later on in the game. Usually that's kind of where the rule of three comes in. So you establish the pattern of your like subversion. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, just a lot of playtesting, so much playtesting. <laughs> Uh, for me, I actually haven't spent a whole lot of time working on level design and like overarching story stuff uh, and pacing. So I'm very much a listener in this question, but I do want to kind of echo things we talked about with uh, accessibility, because after leaving college and having far less free time, it's always really nice to have a game that is super accommodating when you can pick it up and when you can put it down. And whenever I pick up a game that is really welcoming in that respect. It is a really nice feeling to be able to be right where I left off, but also like, I do acknowledge that like somebody put in the time to make sure that I could walk away after five minutes and come back right where I left off. And that feels really nice. Yeah, yeah. that sort of gameplay loop, huh? Yeah, and that can even follow through on games that you don't think, you know, like big, like the MMOs that we work on at Blizzard, like World of Warcraft. If you think about the way that even a world like ours is designed, where people literally spend like hundreds of hours, dozens of playing the game, it's still designed to have discrete breakpoints frequently. You know, when you finish a quest, and maybe there's an NPC that'll offer you another quest, but that's also an opportunity to stop. Uh, we're always conscious of the player flow, and while we always want to direct them, like Carrie said earlier, about being a clarity and the player always knowing where to go. You can still design it to allow the player to have their own breakpoints and decide when is good for them to walk away. Maybe the player's going to stop. Maybe they're going to go into a go to a dungeon run, etc. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, we have a lot of viewers that are students trying to make it into game development. Um, what do you folk wish you knew before you entered the industry yourself? And in your specialties, what would you look for in a portfolio for someone working underneath you, a junior designer? As a general answer to something that I wish I knew, it was, um, I guess, more the perspective of the people that were hiring me. Um, so I came into uh, City Entertainment as an intern uh, doing storyboards at the time, actually. And uh, I was just so excited. Oh, I finally got an internship. They're so nice to allow me this, this privilege. And um, that was all very true. Uh, but what I didn't recognize until I got there was how much they also needed somebody to help out on their end. Um, so I suppose the, the big thing when I'm teaching that I try to talk to my students about is, um, you know, kind of imagine yourself in the shoes of uh, the person that might be hiring you when you are writing your cover letter, for instance. Um, things like, oh, like, I'm the biggest fan of games, and you're all, all, the only thing in your cover letter is how you're a big fan of games. Um, you know, I'm, I'm desperately here trying to be like, oh, I like, really need like a little bit of help or I want somebody um, that I can work with or that uh, can think like the, uh, to help, think to help me solve a problem in the game. Um, kind of uh, finding those things in yourself and being able to, to say them. I was so lucky early on, I got pulled into a meeting probably on like my second or third day uh, with all the heads of the company um, and the publisher, because <laughs> so we were preparing something for the publisher. Um, and, That's a little scary. Oh, it was so scary. <laughs> and, um, and they were like, oh, we have this problem. We need to deliver this thing to the publisher. And they all looked at me and they said, Jessica, what, what should we do? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm just the intern. And I'm so glad that somebody said it. They said, um, no, we hired you because you have a skill set that none of us at this table have. What do you think we should do? And I was like, okay, <laughs> we should do this. And I did have the training for that. Um, I studied film in school. So that was, uh, but it worked out very well. <laughs> And I've tried to kind of keep that mentality ever since, I suppose. Yeah, and try and think about what can set you apart from other applicants. I think, you know, when we're looking uh, for, you know, interns or entry-level positions, you know, especially at a, a studio like ours where we get lots of applications, it's about trying, trying to put something personal in the application in a way that isn't just, you know, your portfolio is great, we want to see your games that you've made, whether they're student projects or personal projects, but also we want to understand a little bit more about you as a person and what unique skill set you might bring. Because if there's another 100 or 400 students applying for the same role, and a lot of you are in game design courses, you'll have very similar resumes, you'll have very similar portfolios, you, the person, is kind of the only differentiating factor and finding some way to put some of your personality and figure out, you know, what is it you're offering? Why do you want to work on this game? Uh, I'd strongly advise students to tailor their applications to the person they're applying to. I know it's a lot of extra time, but I, I get so sad when I see someone's got a really good portfolio and then they send me their cover letter and it's Dear Disney Interactive. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, you know, come on, you could have just, you know, because that shows me you haven't got attention to detail and all these other things. You know, it's just take the time and try and sell why you'd want to work with who it is that you're talking to. Because if anyone's doing recruitment on a regular basis, they will recognize a form letter from a thousand miles away. <laughs> uh, so put some effort into it because it is competitive and it's really, you know, I. it's kind of weird. I actually say, I was talking to my game director about this the other day. We we're like, we wonder if we would make it if it, we were trying to get into the business now uh, because it was it's so much more competitive than it was like 15, 20 years ago when we started. Uh, you know, I don't think anyone else applied for the role that I first got in games. Like, <laughs> I think there was kind of, I was their choice or they'd have to wait to find someone, you know, spend longer. But so it's it's much more competitive. So trying to find that thing that can set you apart uh, and I know that's weird and it's kind of, it's an ob almost obtuse abstract thing because it's not a rule. It's not a thing you can tick off in a checkbox. But I firmly believe if you are creative and you love making games and you, you personally will be able to bring something unique. You just have to figure out what it is and be able to identify it and be able to put it into your applications. So in your mind, Craig, a, like, um, a creative like cover letter would 
been out more than like a um, a short, like smooth, like professional, um, like black and white cover Probably, letter. If like you did something yeah. creative. Yeah, like I think one thing with cover letters, don't make them a copy, don't make them a repeat of your resume. I see too many cover letters that my name is, I'm going to this school, I've made these games and I wanna work for your company. I'm like, cool, your resume told me all of that and the fact that you replied. <laughs> you just wasted your time writing this letter. What I want from a cover letter is some insight into your life, your aspirations, what you love, what elements of game, and what you've learned from being a game designer so far and what you want to learn in the future. I can get all the other information from your resume or your portfolio uh, or a Google search. I'm not going to, your cover letter is your opportunity to tell me what I don't know about you. I Carrie think, and you? Um, sure. I, uh, one thing that I think is very important to understand, which um, a lot of people who are watching this and who are uh, already in game design programs might understand this better already, uh, is just how collaborative uh, the work is. Um, I think it's, you know, I think it stands to reason that a um, an idea that can be implemented is always going to be better than a fantastic, amazing, brilliant idea that we just don't have the tool set or the resources to implement. And understanding how your ideas will be implemented um, and what they'll look like when they are, um, you know, unless you're a you know, a team of one, um, you're going to need to work with your artists, your writers, your systems designers, your level designers um, to understand how the content that you want to make is going to fit into the, the larger context of the game. Um, and so having someone who approaches their work and approaches their team with a, with a collaborative spirit is super important. Um, it is a big red flag to me, uh, you know, in an interview or something where you hear someone who doesn't really have anything good to say about the people they've worked with or, you know, the experience they've had with, you know, getting feedback or iterating on things. Um, because, you know, when we're when we're hiring, we're not just looking for someone who's going to be sharp and smart and technically skilled. We're also looking for someone who's going to be a good add to the team that we already have that we care very much about. Um, so that's huge. Uh, and, you know, just in addition to for narrative, at least, you know, understanding your writing fundamentals, um, you know, being able to write good, clean prose uh, and dialogue, that's hugely important. Um, and for RPGs, being able to approach storytelling um, with a, I guess, a fairly player, player centric approach, um, you know, where again, you understand that you're authoring a story, um, but at the same time, that has to be presented to players uh, in a way that, um, Again, they have some agency in progressing it. Um, it's not going to be a super linear experience. And that's not at all to say, you know, one type is better than the other. It's just what we're looking for with branching narrative is someone who can, you know, give players sort of a playground. Having just kind of come out the other side of the hiring process, I think my big takeaway is to just not, is to just keep going and for as hard as it is when you do get those rejections to try not to take them personally. Um, Cause now having been on the other side, it's when you're at, like in the game development side, there's so many things going on that when we're looking at different people to hire, it's usually never that we dislike somebody or we want them to feel bad if they aren't a good fit. It's just, there's so many people and there's usually like one, one or two things that, kind of to distinguish the candidate that we do go with. Um, and so even those re those rejection letters feel really harsh. They're not really coming from a place of malice. You're and not then, behind the keyboard maniacally laughing. Yeah. <laughs> it's if, if everybody could be hired, they would be hired. But I've, obviously that just can't happen. So and then like the job I got was the first job I actually got accepted for after like a just a lot of rejections from so many different companies. But where I'm at now, I'm so happy that I got rejected from everywhere else because I would have taken any one of those uh, acceptance letters if I got them. But the role I'm in right now, I have so much more creative freedom and a lot more responsibility that I probably would have gotten at a lot of other places to work. And it ended up being a weird sort of thing that the best fit for me was the one that I did end up getting. And I did get rejected from a lot of other jobs, but that might've been for the best because I think I'm a better fit here than I would have been there. I think just the one thing to follow up with something Carrie said, which is really 
a trick for interviews that I really try and pay attention to, uh, to give it some advice to everyone here, is the, uh, the teamwork is vitally important. Everything I said about collaboration is absolutely true. And one of the things I watch for when I interview junior people is whether they use the word I or we a lot. Uh, and I know it's counterintuitive almost to say, if someone only talks about I in an interview, I did this, I did that, I did this, when talking about group projects, it's an automatic red flag for me. It's not like I won't hire them, but it makes me pause and think. And it's really, it's almost counterintuitive advice because you're in an interview, right? You're supposed to be selling yourself and you're, you want to be uh, you know, pushing your virtues. But if you're not acknowledging the work of the other people that worked on the projects with you, that can, that can give people pause. Uh, I definitely notice it. Whenever I come out of an interview and I think about it, I'm like, they didn't use the word we once. And they work on a team. I'm like, OK, that's a red flag for me. I'm going to have, if, we, if there's a second interview, I'm going to be poking more on that. Or, you know, so just be careful of your language and, you know, uh, be mindful of that when you're interviewing. It's almost like the the company is a D and D party looking for a new character, and you'd rather have a cleric than a rogue. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, kind of to go kind of more specific too, as far as uh, level design, um, when we're having our interviews, um, one of the questions that if we take a candidate enough to um, you know look past the portfolio and perhaps give a test, um, one of the things that we'll often do is we'll give a piece of direction. Um, so being able to follow that direction, sometimes, um, I all see a candidate that's actually done it like very well. Uh, I've gotten some that I was like, oh, wow, like we could just put this into the game. Um, but I'm always looking to make sure that they're going to fit in with our team and our communication, uh, that we can have kind of an, a collaborative experience. So I might offer something up or I'll ask the director to offer something up, um, and we'll come back and then we'll, we'll look at the the test at the end. So if someone gives you feedback, maybe it's not necessarily a bad thing, but we're again looking for, <laughs> we're looking for, um, yeah, how, how we can communicate together. These are all great, great tips. Um, as I said, many of our viewers are new to development. And um, I know a few of us designers, a few of you guys have worked at the head of a project before. And um, I know that personally, as I begin a project, I kind of feel a little bit like that picture of Charlie Day with the conspiracy board behind him. Um, when you guys first begin to design your own projects, where do you begin and what is your designer writing process like? I, I think for me, it's about defining the core goals. You'll often hear designers talk to them about as design pillars. Uh, you know, you'll often hear projects have those. And there's a reason for that. It's that you kind of need your guiding principle. Uh, and especially if the team's large, it, this varies. I, I think there's a tendency to think this might vary based on the size of the team, but I actually think it holds true regardless whether you're five people, 50 or 500, uh, is if you know the core philosophies, it's not about microing people and making every creative decision, because that's the worst thing you can do as a creative leader is try and micromanage every single decision. It's about setting the goal. We want this game, you know, what are the core goals of your game? Kind of what is its core audience? You know, is this a niche game or is this a accessible game? You know, if you hope to sell, you know, 10 million copies of a game, it's going to have to be reasonably accessible. And then that can be a pillar of your design. OK, accessibility is one of our pillars. Uh, and then some of them might be driven by your IP. Uh, some of them might be driven by the style of game you're making. Uh, and it's not, you can be anywhere on the spectrum for that. You know, you might be making an ultra hardcore niche game uh based on you know some really hardcore mechanics with permadeath and that's going to limit its audience but as long as you know what you're making you can then be true to those decisions i think where teams get in trouble is where the goals are vague and they don't really know what kind of game they're making they're like well this is popular and that's popular and this is popular and maybe we can smush it up and they kick too many creative decisions down their kick the cans down the road uh and then you get to a point where you're like, I don't really know what this game is. And you are that guy with the conspiracy board behind him. And he's like, what, what the hell is our game? Uh, so clarity and understanding what the pillars of your design are so that you can always return to them and go, what are we making again? OK, we've got confusion. 
we're not sure about how to proceed with the decision, go back to your pillars. Is the decision serving one of those core pillars? Speaking of pillars, Carrie, Pillars of Eternity had its own niche audience, those Baldur's Gate fans who had just kind of been hungry in the corner. So um, could you uh, speak uh, as uh, about the, uh, the, the concepts that were uh, the core of that project? Yeah, so I mean, I, for Pillars specifically, um, yeah, there with the first one, we were trying to take uh, this old school approach to, you know, isometric RPGs, classic fantasy, um, but bring something new into it as well. And so I, I think this reflects on something that um, I think Craig said earlier, where it's, uh, you know, this wasn't a long running IP, but it was. Uh, there was some nostalgia associated with long running IPs. And so understanding um, what's important about those and what we wanted to bring forward and where we wanted to give players a new and novel experience. Um, and the, you know, the design and leadership team, I think had an incredible breadth of experience on isometric RPGs, um, as well as, you know, more recent versions of, you know, more recent RPGs um, and in fantasy. And so their perspective was super valuable in understanding like, well, you know, here's some of the touchstones for players who love things like Baldur's Gate and D and D, and for people who have, you know, a tabletop background. And here's how we can bring that into the player's experience. So things like the um, the scripted interactions, you know, where which are basically like little illustrated storybook moments um, where the player can attempt to solve a particular challenge in any number of ways. You know, that's your DM throwing you into a situation, and you know. Kind of like if you're a rogue, you might try to climb up the wall. If you're, you know, really diplomatic, maybe you try to bribe the guard or something. Um, but you know, just giving players finding finding what those what the touchstones of those experiences are, um, and then putting them into the game, but then still making sure that the story and the world we're weaving around them um, is fresh and distinct, and that there's intentionality uh, behind the things that we're making. I think even when you're making something that is you know, rooted in nostalgia for something specific or that it is that is rooted in a long running IP, um, you know, saying, well, we're doing this just because or just because this is kind of what everyone does, um, I think can lead to weaker design decisions. And so understanding why you're making creative decisions about your IP. Um, and if, if there is a particular thing that you're like, well, this is baked in um, and we can't really change or retcon this, but like, okay, well, what story hasn't been told around it or what's something new or fresh that we can reflect on with it? Um, you know, making sure that you are being, uh, again, I think as Craig said, intentional with the decisions you're making is hugely important. I'm sure there was um, a point where you had to like, pinpoint the touchstones and then just stop and take a step back so that you don't get any feature creep, huh? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely easy to do, especially in RPGs, which are, you know, very systems heavy, um, you know, which you try to have a lot of content so that players really get that feeling that they're, you know, immersed in this big world and, you know, just carving their way through it one way or another. Um, yeah, I mean, feature creep is really important. And I, I think there you just have to be disciplined about, um, you know, prioritizing what's important to your game and what's important to the experience you're offering players um, and and being ready just to, to nip something in the bud when you find out that it isn't working because it's really easy to get into sunk cost fallacy and say like, but 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 this thing could be so cool. We, we just need to try another thing. Um, we, we just Let's just give it one more iteration cycle. I mean, yeah, every game is going to have stuff that you you know is the design team. Uh, we could have done this and we either didn't have the time or we, we didn't figure out what to do with it. Um, that's okay. I kind of do that. I feel like thing. Um, but playtesting really can help figure out a lot of that. Um, kind of, again, starting from your pillars and seeing, oh, is it clicking into place for someone who's outside the team? Um, are they getting the same thing out of it that in theory, in my brain, in my conspiracy brain, I think is, is actually working, but it didn't translate quite as well. Uh, um, so one of uh, early on, I had, you know, was working on an indie project um, and uh, we all thought, oh, you know, part of it's going to be platforming, but we want it to be a puzzle platformer. And so we want every movement to really just be this thoughtful piece of movement. And we tested it and uh, it, it outside of the <laughs> outside of our our office no one knew what was going on. And they were just like, I just want to be able to jump. And in the end, we just completely took out half of our movement mechanics um, and the game was way better for it um, and, and much more appreciated. 
and yeah, that was sad, uh, but we had readjusted and, um, you know, mourned it for a little moment <laughs> and came back to the project and it was just much better for it. What I really like about that is, you know, the distinction between your design intent and then the effect on players, you know, it's because like, I, I see this in writing too, you know, you might have a passage or a chapter or something and someone says, ah, I was confused by this. So this doesn't land for me. And it's very easy to go, well, but what I was intending was this. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what you intend if it doesn't create a good experience that is um, sufficiently clear to players or readers. Absolutely. Ian, you were kind of the rallying cry behind the features in your game Squish. So when yeah. when did you do you want to co uh, co comment on this? And when did you um have to like realize like okay we we only have like these four mechanics that we we put into the game. Let's work on those before we push forward. Yeah. Um. For me, when I was working on my senior project, uh, it actually started out as a board game. So we we're doing a lot of paper prototyping, which was super helpful and that having a very short amount of time to make a game and wanting to kind of be confident before it was pitched to the rest of the class uh having made the like a board game version that was super easy to iterate on uh gave me a lot of confidence when i was trying to recruit other people to the team and have sort of a vision with it like it wasn't just in my head it there was a tangible version you could look at and kind of wrap your head around uh and then kind of going from there with the process, since we had those core mechanics kind of tested out, we always had this sliding scale of things we could add into the game uh, based on how much time we had. So like worst case scenario, we can't really add a lot of new stuff. So let's just refine these core mechanics we've already fleshed out. And then best case, we can start adding stuff on slowly uh, bit by bit. Almost like um, Kickstarter stretch goals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just with no money. <laughs> um, for um, a, we had a, a question about UI, and I kind of combined it with another question. Um, recently, I was playing Baldur's Gate. Now that it's on the Nintendo Switch, and the implementation of the UI and controls just feels so natural. Um, an all-encompassing feature of game design is affordance, how naturally a, player's, a player handles anything from UX, UI, or even uh, how to ensure a level naturally guides a player to its end. How do you design with affordances in mind? I think that the answer to that question is very different based on the type of game and the space that you're talking, because there's hundreds of different types, thousands of different types of affordances. Uh, that come from other games, that come from human inclination. Uh, I think, again, I know it sounds a bit repetitive, but understanding what they are and being intentional with your design about how you're going to use them, because affordances can be used to either really make your design intuitive, or when you want to go against them, you have to be doing so intentionally and know what it is. Oh, we lost someone. Oh, we lost her. Know oh, how it is. All right, keep going. <laughs> uh, you have to know what you want to achieve. It's not to say that you always have to conform to these norms of design and do the same thing as everyone else because that's become an affordance. Because you know, players have played this style of game a hundred times and they're used to the map being in the top right corner. That doesn't mean the map always has to be in the top right corner, but you have to understand as a designer that if you don't put it in the top right corner, you're going to have some extra work to do to make it intuitive to the player in the context of your game. So it's really important to understand the type of affordances that might influence the type of game you're making, whether that's intuitive of controls or UI layout or expected character behavior. You know, you can, these are all affordances that we bring with us from other media and other games and other cultural influences. And just as a designer, your job is to manipulate them. It's not necessarily to conform to them all the time time it's to understand them and know when you can use them uh, to your benefit yeah I, and, go ahead oh, sorry um yeah one of the things that's always been very helpful to me when i've done both level design and user interface design is uh, i have a lot of background in art 
um, and studied art and animation as well as you know just composition because film school. Um, and so uh, a lot of that study involves uh, where is the viewer's eye going? Uh, what are you inclined to look at when you just kind of want to naturally rest on a page? Um, does it follow a trail? Is that trail slow or is it and it weaves around the space or is that fast and you look directly to something? Um, and so all of those again are, are tools in our tool chest, uh, you know, exactly. Um, and uh, it's just where do we want to use them to produce like what effect, what feeling in the player? Um, so every every game is is very different. Uh, Armored Warfare, for instance, um, is a game about tanks. <laughs> you play as a tank, as a first person tank. Um, and so our user interface was designed around your your center reticle that you were going to be aiming and shooting. So I wanted to make sure, and then you're on the kind of a flat horizon. So that's a case where we put our map in the bottom left hand corner to kind of like just open up the horizon a little bit. Um, so that you could look onto the horizon for the tanks on the horizon you needed to fight. Um, and then having centering the most important parts that you needed to know at a glance, how many bullets do I have left over recharge, bullets, shells, <laughs> uh, things like that, centering them around our center reticle. So without having to like look somewhere else and lose your focus because you were kind of moving the camera with your, your tracking piece, um, you could understand uh, your status in the game. So again, it's, you know, an application of what were the game's goals, um, what are the design principles that just kind of exist and humans kind of naturally fall into. Um, and again, that can be culturally different. So, uh, you know, typically Western, we might look left to right um, and the space seems more open if we have the right side open uh, traveling somewhere versus um, more Eastern audiences, we might start, um, you know, filling up the right space first and leaving the left space open. Um, so just, looking out for those tools. Um, it's hard to know them all at once, but I've always found that beginning to just even ask a question, then you can, if you know what question to ask, you can Google it, <laughs> look into it. Um, but all of those have really helped me in both level design and uh, user interface design. Uh, for me, I've, I think a huge part of it is just budgeting for that type of play testing and that type of iteration. Um, cause like I was younger, when I was younger playing games, I just sort of assumed every month you have on the game is like a new level or a new character or something like that. But having spent a lot more time making them, it's, it's kind of surprising how much time you spend getting your core ideas done. And then how much more time goes into iterating and just constantly play testing and balancing feedback too. Cause you get a lot of criticism from play testers that it might be like, oh, we want this or like, oh, this felt bad. Um, and a lot, sometimes that is something you want to iterate on. And then other times we've noticed that it's, people will say something and then it might not actually be a problem for them, uh, a few minutes later, like they'll kind of adapt to it. And it's, an uh, interesting balance to figure out which situations are which and what feedback is just part of the learning curve and what feedback actually needs to be address to make that initial impression uh, more positive. I think it's also valuable to have um, voices from a lot of different disciplines and backgrounds in the room when you're making a decision or, or trying to design a particular experience. Um, you know, because if you've if you've got a room full of writers or artists or level designers, you know, people are going to tend to rely on the tools that they know and that they work with. Um, and perhaps be less mindful of the tools and disciplines that are not familiar to them. And that, that's just human nature. You know, we use what we know. Um, and so if you're talking about guiding a player through a level, you know, you may have a writer say, well, you know, let's make sure this NPC who's giving you the quest tells you this. Um, you may have a level designer say, well, let's just make sure that, you know, the the shape of the level just pulls the player forward in this direction and that we don't have, you know, large branches kind of pulling players off to the side so they know where they're going. And you might have an artist saying like, well, let's put some big, interesting, flashy thing in the distance here that's just naturally going to draw players. And sound designers saying like, well, we can, uh, if we can have some ambiance of, you know, something that's going on in the distance here, that'll also draw players along. Um, and all of those are valid and good and useful. Um, and I think the best solution is going to take from all of those toolboxes and use um, all of those design disciplines together in order to create an experience where Players like players don't necessarily think about how they know where to go because it just feels right. 
Um, and I think that's why it can be very easy to overlook how important good uh, UX design is, is because when it's done really well, you're not thinking about it. It's only when it's done poorly that you're like, man, this is just messy and confusing. And I'm not really sure. Sh- now I'm thinking about why. It's When it's done well, it's almost invisible. Mm-hmm. I think the, the, the first um, area of Outer Worlds, you can do completely backwards and it just feels natural too. <laughs> like you can go one way or you can go completely the opposite the other way and both feel natural. Um, I have a few more of like, we have a few questions. I'm going to try to ask some of the more, um, the ones that everyone's going to be able to touch on. Um, so, do, do, <laughs> when playing through games, um, what completely takes you guys out of games when you encounter it? Something that people might not um, really realize until they've entered the entered the industry, kind of your design pet peeves. And do you have um, simple ways that you feel that they could be solved? Consistency is one for me, that the rules of your game are correct. If you break the rules of your game, and I'll give you a really silly example, but I think this demonstrates the point, uh, is ladders. If I see a ladder in your game, I want to know whether I can climb up it or not. And once you let me climb up it once, I am going to be frustrated as hell if you don't let me climb up the next one I see, because you've decided that's just background. Uh, consult that, and it's a little bit of a flippant example, but it can, it's, it's about consistency. Your game world has rules. Your game has rules. Make them fair and consistent to me so I understand them. And that if you do want to subvert them, that's cool later on, especially narratively. But do it deliberately again. And don't do it by accident because most of the times where it creates a bad experience is when you've just not thought about it. And you put a, you know, whatever it is, a special ability, a power up that you can use here that does this thing, and then you arbitrarily stop it from working in the next fight because you are solving some other design problem, that sucks. You gave me this thing. You told me it was cool. You got me to use it, and then the next, all the next bosses are immune to it. Uh, I'm like, okay, why'd you do that? Because that's not particularly fun to me. Uh, so be consistent and try and think of ways where you can make that experience consistent for the player and you're not just arbitrarily breaking the rules that you're creating yourself. If you're going to be uh, able to fly on like one level, like the next level, the player will expect to be able to fly. Yeah, I think uh, related to consistency um, on the more narrative side, cutscene incompetence is always kind of frustrating. Um, and that's a tricky one to get around because, you know, over the course of a, a game, you you need obstacles and challenges to arise to, to keep raising the stakes and making sure that the road ahead um, doesn't look too smooth for too long. Um, that creates tension and it creates fun. Um, but finding ways to uh, to make those things happen in a way that doesn't suddenly make, you know, a skilled character seem incompetent, or that doesn't suddenly make, you know, a character that the player has maybe been driving their decision making and defining who they are, you know, saying, well, you know, suddenly this person who could be this range of things in this one cutscene is now this one thing because we have to get them to do this one thing in order for this problem to develop. Um, it's very hard, uh, but there are almost always better solutions um, than just forcing the player character to do something incompetent or foolish. Um, Sometimes it can be even just, you know, well, sure, here's the thing they'd like to do, but here's maybe a consequence of that that they didn't foresee. Or here's something they'd like to do, and then suddenly here's something over here that's actually more important or a more immediate risk. Um, I think you can can better, you can justify those moments. You just have to look for uh, other ways to do them. You have to balance them, which is better than just, encountering the ludo narrative dissonance that would occur otherwise huh um like same for like level design if you're gonna design a level and you're like oh it's gonna be for like wizards the player might show up and all four of them that are playing are like playing a barbarian style class (laughs) just not having a good time (laughs) jessica or ian did you have any comments on on this yeah, I think um, one sort of mechanic that I see pop up a lot, um, it's a bit more minor, um, 
is having like audio logs or like text logs in a game that's not really about reading or about the pacing that you would want to have while reading. Um, so if like I'm playing a shooter and it's super fast paced and really aggressive, and then there's suddenly like a bunch of lore dumps in these um, like things you're finding, it doesn't really make sense for that character to suddenly sit down in the middle of a fight and start reading like heavy scripture. Um, and I think when you're telling a story, it's good to keep in mind kind of the aesthetic and like the emotion of your game. So if your game is really aggressive and really fast, sometimes the story can be told through the environment you're going through and the player can pick up on things of like, Oh, if like, if there's a lot of, I don't know, like destroyed robots here or something like there's like, there's been a battle here or even like pacing from rooms to room. If I'm going from like, um, like a trait, like a gladiator arena to like a library, you get an idea of like why these areas have been placed where they are and what that says about the world. Um, but still moving through it at the speed that the game kind of wants you to and not having to stop and kind of break all that pacing that's already been built up. Bioshock does a really great job with that, with their uh, their narrative environmental storytelling. Totally, yeah. Yeah, and just to underline what everyone else is saying, I think for me, it's when I'm working with level design, clear player expectations um, and the game delivering on that. So if, you know, something functions one way, like the ladder, right? Or um, uh, but yeah, if I can use one of my special abilities on something in the environment, um, I want to be able to, at a glance, see that I can do that again. And we can make that more complicated by complicating that scenario, much like Carrie mentioned with writing. Um, we can we can add complications to that to make a puzzle, but at a glance, I want to understand how that works. I don't want to like be like, oh, like before you shot a, a green circle with your gun. Now you're shooting like, I don't know, a flower. <laughs> like, um that's a you know is a red flower so um just that level of consistency because uh in a game we're asking you to like process and see a lot of stuff very fast um especially if we're putting tension on the player with with um combat or narratively you're like oh you got to run because something's happening you want to be able to at a glance understand what to do and that to the player creates a sense of fairness um and so uh we always kind of one of our like goals i feel like in design very often is uh we want the player to feel like if they they didn't succeed in a scenario uh, it was not the game's fault but a situation where they can try again and do better um and that's like one of the best feelings i think we can get from a player so just a clear understanding of the world is a great way to one of the many ways to accomplish that uh i we're getting so many questions for you guys but sadly the design panel uh, we do have to come to a close. Um, I asked uh, many of the questions that were asked over and over again, so we, I tried to hit all of those ones. Um, but that is all about that is about all the time that we have for the panel. I want to give a warm thank you to all of our designers for coming in, and I want to ask if you folks have any final words of wisdom for our viewers. Be the team member that you'd want to work with. Um, you know, at the end of the day, there's always going to be more we wish we could have done on our games. But, um, you know, be kind to yourself, be kind to the rest of your team. Um, this is a wonderful field to be in. And I think we're all very fortunate to be here. Uh, and it's, you know, uh, yeah, just approach it with a spirit of fun and collaboration. Yeah. That's I'd say, good note. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would say um, just keep going and and don't give up. And even if things are getting hard right now or in the future, you'd be surprised that the opportunities um, that are around the corner that you never even knew existed are there and they're going to be so exciting when you get there. Just remember why you do it. You, we all love games and we love creating these experiences and allowing other people to feel, you know, different emotions when they're playing our games. Uh, and just keep making games and you know like i said be be a good be a good person doing it and you won't go far wrong yeah it's one of the, it can be hard sometimes because at the end of the day yes it's work but also again we're so lucky to be in i think you know this this position and uh really get to do some fun creative stuff so taking a step back occasionally um 
you know, looking at the big picture, uh, looking to why you got inspired in the first place, like your players or um, working with the team is one of like the best feelings, actually. So, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Be positive. Yeah, I hope we can do it. Yeah. Remember why you like it and be a team player. All right. Uh, we're going to close the panel here. Thank you guys for coming onto the panel. Um, there's a lot of people. Thank you guys in Twitch chat right now. Um, and we're going to sign off now. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.